This 17th century African princess led her people into battle against European colonists and slave traders and won. Let's get to know the diplomats, assassin, and warrior queen who became the mother of modern Angola. Born in 1581, or maybe 1583, Njinga Mbande was ruler of Ndongo and Matamba, kingdoms in what is now Angola in Central Africa. We learn her backstory as it's depicted in the Netflix limited series African Queens Njinga. She was the daughter of King Kilu Anji of Ndongo. Unfortunately, she wasn't technically a princess of the royal line. Njinga was likely born to one of the king's favorite concubines, not a legit wife. But that tiny technicality never held Njinga back. From day one, she was destined for greatness. Legend has it that Njinga was born with the umbilical cord wrapped around her throat. In fact, her name is derived from the Kimbundu word Kajinga, which means to twist, and the baby was named after the ordeal she had already survived at birth. A wise woman, possibly the midwife, saw how tough the baby was and declared that she would make a great queen. And sure enough, Njinga would prove herself a survivor again and again over the years. Her greatest accomplishment would be achieving what her father started out to do around the time she was born, holding off colonial oppression. Her father saw the writing on the wall and started pushing back against Portuguese incursions around 1581. The Portuguese are gnawing at us, picking away at the skin until they get to the bone. It was in this tense political and military environment on the brink of all-out war that little Njinga grew up. Being a royal princess during a time of massive political upheaval while living under constant threat of war is never fun. Tensions were particularly high in Central Africa in the late 1500s. Ndongo was surrounded by older African empires like Congo, which resented the little upstart kingdom. Western colonial empires were eagerly taking advantage of the situation, making and breaking alliances regularly and stocking all sides with weapons. It was a win-win for the colonizers, especially Portugal. They could sell weapons to both sides and use the cash to buy captives to supply the slave trade. We are people born running from extinction. And so young Njinga, living in the royal capital of Kibasa, witnessed all manner of court intrigue, political machinations, vicious battles, and frantic attempts to keep the kingdom independent and afloat. An intelligent kid, she soaked up everything her father could teach her about being a ruthless leader and a voice of the people. When her father died, things got messy. First of all, he may not have died of natural causes, even when you account for the loose definition of natural in the royal courts at the time. Njinga's half-brother Mbandi may have hastened their father's death, then consolidated his rule by eliminating the only other male heir, Njinga's infant son. Njinga packed up and fled. A few years later, in 1622, she returned to take up a diplomatic post. But why go to work for someone who killed your father and son? If Game of Thrones has taught us anything, it's that keeping your enemies close can be a good strategy. And besides, Mbandi really needed her help. He'd suffered defeat after defeat by the Portuguese and their local allies. In fact, some contemporaneous accounts imply that he was a lousy ruler. Njinga turned out to be a talented diplomat and power broker. It helped that Njinga spoke Portuguese and could negotiate directly, unlike her brother. In one of the first meetings she took with Joa Correa de Souza, the Portuguese colonial envoy, he tried to place her at a disadvantage by putting out too few chairs. She would have to sit on a floor mat like a commoner, but Njinga wasn't having it. You didn't need to inconvenience yourself on my behalf. I always come prepared. She called over a servant and had them get down on all fours. She then sat on her new chair for the multi-hour negotiation, coming out at the end with a treaty that positioned Ndongo as a trade partner with Portugal rather than a target. A treaty is only useful as long as both sides keep their promises. Within a couple of years, the Portuguese were back to stirring up local rivalries and attacking the kingdom of Ndongo. In the midst of this turmoil, Njinga's brother, King Mbandi, died. Some accounts indicate he died by suicide, a shame that he couldn't rule his kingdom properly, while others suggest that Njinga finally got fed up and killed her brother. Either way, Njinga declared herself queen in 1624, defying the tradition declaring that only males of the royal line could rule. She used a complex web of political power plays, metaphors, and gender bending to stake her claim to the throne and then racked up a series of military victories to prove she was the best person for the job. Historian Linda M. Haywood explained that the Portuguese didn't want Njinga to be queen. They knew that she was going to insist on being in on Ndongo being independent. But while Njinga did her best to manage the Portuguese, including briefly converting to Christianity to gain some negotiating leverage, they betrayed her and usurped the throne. True to her character, however, Queen Njinga didn't take things lying down. She returned to Matamba, where she'd been exiled during her brother's earlier reign, and she set herself up as their queen, determined to cause trouble. 
There was no way Njinga was going to ignore the fact that her Portuguese allies had stolen her kingdom. From her new home in Matamba, she began harboring fugitives, engaging in spy tactics, and supporting rebellions in what had once been her territory. She trained local youths as guerrilla fighters, creating militias that could move stealthily back into the Portuguese slaving port of Luanda to carry out raids and attacks against them. She also recruited marginalized warriors from other ethnic groups, as well as Portuguese-trained African mercenaries, then used them to infiltrate the Portuguese army back in Nango. By the time she had enough spies, double agents, and mercenaries in place, and had begun to weaken the Portuguese military effort from as many sides as possible, she started launching open attacks on the border. The next step was getting someone else to do the fighting for her. In 1641, Queen Njinga formed an alliance with the Dutch, reckoning that the enemy of her enemy was her friend. All-out war isn't the only way to bring down a nation, though, and Queen Njinga knew that. If slavery was at the heart of a number of African societies at the time. Wars in the region produced plenty of captives that Europeans would pay handsomely for. To hit her Portuguese enemies where it really hurt, in the wallet, Queen Njinga decided not only to outlaw slavery in her territory, but also turn Mataba into a sanctuary state. Tell the governor there are no slaves here in my kingdom. She built up her power by taking in anyone who hated, feared, or otherwise opposed the Portuguese in the area. Word spread quickly, and the population of Matamba grew to the point where the Portuguese were forced to concede defeat and leave. But the respite was brief. They were back by 1648, and the Dutch, severely outgunned, decided to leave Central Africa, thereby abandoning Queen Njinga to her fate. Njinga wasn't just a politically savvy operator, she was also a warrior queen. She personally led troops into battle and evaded every attempt made to capture or kill her. Her battlefield heroics started early. Her father took her into battle beside him when she was just a preteen. Even if she didn't pick up a musket quite that young, she was exposed to high-level lessons in tactics and military strategy, key lessons for outboxing the Portuguese and rival African nations in later life. Njinga held the title of general and reportedly wore men's clothing on the regular, though we also have several period images of her in women's clothing. Contemporary sources do record her taking part in combat, and you have to admit that trousers would be more practical on the battlefield. As historian Linda M. Haywood points out in her book, Njinga of Angola, Africa's Warrior Queen, Njinga was nothing if not practical. She would have worn whatever gave her the biggest advantage in a given situation. Njinga didn't put down her battle axe until she was well into her 60s. Even then, she kept on organizing guerrilla attacks against the Portuguese colonists. Njinga wasn't all work and no play. There are different cultures in Africa where women can have different partners. She allegedly kept a harem of up to 60 men. Given that rulers of the time frequently kept multiple concubines, Queen Njinga probably felt entitled to her collection of lovers. But accounts differ on how she ran that harem. Some of the more reputable early sources assert that Njinga just had a whole bunch of her guys vying to serve her every need. But other sources say she dressed these strapping young lads as women and claimed them as her wives. This might be true. She may have been gender fluid, or perhaps she wanted to legitimize her reign by acting out the role of a male ruler, given the challenges to her power in the patriarchal Mbundu society. Being a member of her harem wasn't easy. To earn the honor of sleeping with the queen, you had to first survive a gladiator match. If you lived through it and Njinga liked your gumption, you got to spend the night with her, but not the morning. According to one colorful source, the infamous Marquis de Sade, writing in Philosophy in the Bedroom, Queen Njinga had her lovers killed after a single night with her. According to Marilyn French and From Eve to Dawn, A History of Women in the World, Njinga finally settled down at age 75 with the youngest of her wives. Granted, a lot of these accounts are viciously sexist, and we can't be sure they're accurate, but wow. Tough as it was, Queen Njinga managed to stay off full Western rule of her lands for more than 30 years. Even when Luanda was overthrown, she managed to keep Matamba free until her death at the ripe old age of 82. Part of her success was in building strategic alliances and positioning Ndongo as a trading partner. Queen Njinga regularly assessed which way the political winds were blowing, associated herself with whoever could best help keep her people free and relatively unmolested. When the Portuguese reconquered Luanda in 1648, Queen Njinga once again took up the role of diplomat and initiated peace talks. After six whole years of haggling, she finally got a deal she could live with, though she would have to concede more and more power as time went by. In her later years, Queen Njinga spent most of her time trying to rebuild her kingdom after decades of war and strife, ensuring that future generations would be able to prosper, even if the Portuguese screwed them over again, as she no doubt was sure they would, given the track record. 
Tales of Africa's passionate warrior queens spread during the Jinga's own time thanks to stories and illustrations carried back to Europe by various dignitaries. The old human chair tale was illustrated by an Italian priest who witnessed the event, and her growing fame no doubt made it a little easier for her to command the respect of her Portuguese foes. Nijinga was the only African leader to be recognized by European rulers in power as a female king. But her reputation would really skyrocket after Frenchman Jean-Louis Castillon published a semi-historical biography, Jinga Ren d'Angola, in 1770. This colorful work of historical fiction kept her name and legacy alive, with various Angolan writers taking up her story over the years. Today, Queen Njinga is revered as Angola's founding mother, and there's a statue of her in the capital city of Luanda. Interestingly, for someone who converted to Christianity, back to her native religion, and back to Christianity again in her later years, several religions in both Africa and the Caribbean have spiritual figures or demigods based on the warrior queen. UNESCO notes that in Candomblé, an Afro-Brazilian folk religion that developed from enslaved people brought over from Africa, Mantambe is the Lady of Thunder, patron of heroes invoked in battle. One can only hope Njinga is seated on a comfy and willing human throne in the afterlife, grinning for thought.